Welcome back, everyone, to the Evidence-Based Hair Podcast. I'm dermatologist and hair loss specialist, Dr. Jeff Donovan. I'm also the director of the Donovan Hair Academy. The Academy educates the public about hair loss, and we have training programs for hair loss practitioners as well. Hair loss affects all people around the world, and so we welcome all people to our programs. The Donovan Hair Academy runs the EBHF, or the Evidence-Based Hair Fellowship. The EBHF is the world's most comprehensive training program for hair loss specialists. Our EBHF graduates ultimately complete two years of very intensive training and are some of the best trained specialists in the world. The podcast that you're listening to right now is the official podcast of the Donovan Hair Academy. In this podcast, I review studies that are changing how we think about hair loss. I'll introduce them to you, help you make sense of them, and give you my thoughts on how a given study just might change how we diagnose or treat hair loss. And as a reminder, the podcast is for educational purposes and shouldn't be considered a substitute for medical advice. I very much enjoy offering the Evidence-Based Hair podcast. I enjoy being able to join you for our public webinars throughout the year and our ever-popular Question of the Week program. But before we begin today's podcast, I'd like to add that your support really makes a difference. And I thank all those who have supported us over the years. We have some very big goals for the next 10 and 20 years, not only in our podcasts and our webinars and our Question of the Week program and our training programs for healthcare practitioners, but in our multiple tireless efforts to ensure that the principles of evidence-based medicine will always be our guide in this most perplexing and complicated world of hair loss. If you'd like to learn more about our programs and projects that we're currently fundraising for, or to make a donation, please visit the Donovan Hair Academy at donovanhairacademy.com forward slash projects. And now on to our podcast. Today, it's my great pleasure to speak to you about an interesting study in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology and Venereology titled Alopecia Associated with the Use of Semaglutide and Terzepatide, a Disproportionality Analysis Using the FDA Adverse Event Reporting System from 2022 to 2023. I really like this study. We spoke last week about terzepatide, this GLP-1 slash GIP receptor agonist, these weight loss medications which are becoming increasingly popular in the world today. We spoke last week about a wonderful study by Dr. Bardone relating to a gentleman with insulin resistance who used this medication to lose weight and improve his insulin resistance and happened to have an improvement in his hair loss. Today I'd like to speak about alopecia from these medications. Over the last few years, an increasing number of patients have presented to my clinic asking about hair loss with these medications. And it's clear that these medications cause hair loss, but what is unknown is how common do they cause hair loss? Which of these medications used for weight loss are more likely to cause hair loss? And can we document any proof that these medications are causing hair loss? And so I really like this study by Godfrey and colleagues in the June issue of the JEADV. It seeks to analyze data about the potential of these medications to cause hair loss. There is no perfect way of assessing how commonly a medication causes hair loss. If you imagine that there's 3 million people in the world that are prescribed a certain medication, well, the most accurate way to figure out if it, the chances of that medication causing hair loss is to ask all 3 million people in a survey, did you get hair loss? Did you get a headache? Did you get muscle pain? How much weight did you lose? The reality is we can't ask every single person who takes a medication about their side effect profile. So we have to resort to these second best options, like diving into these databases that collect information related to side effects. And one of those databases is this FDA adverse event database. And Godfrey and colleagues in this study 
looked at that FDA adverse event database looking at reports of alopecia from these drugs. So a growing body of data has suggested that these medications, these weight loss drugs, these diabetes medications, but now weight loss drugs, can cause hair loss. And in fact, in 2023, the FDA flagged alopecia as a potential adverse event associated with these medications. And the FDA said, we're going to have to study this a little bit more. We're going to have to evaluate whether we need any further warnings or regulatory actions about alopecia. And that comes as a surprise. You know, it takes a little bit of push for regulatory bodies to pay attention to hair loss as a side effect of a medication. And so it's interesting that the FDA has said, you know what, we're going to look into this further. So stay tuned about comments from the FDA and other health regulatory bodies about hair loss from these medications. But today, let's talk about Godfrey and colleagues and their wonderful study in the JEADV. They set out to study if these GLP-1 agonists and GIP agonists can cause hair loss. And so they did so by diving into this FDA adverse event reporting system. This is a wonderful database where patients and practitioners can enter data about side effects. And so if you have a side effect from a medication and you're a patient, you can put your data into this database. If you're a practitioner and your patient has a side effect, you can enter your patient's data in this database. Clearly, it's a biased database. It takes a special patient to, you know, call up the FDA or go online and say, I want to report my side effect. And it also takes a special practitioner as well, who amongst the endless tasks that they have to do at the end of the day, decides that, you know what, I'm going to sit down and report this side effect. So these databases are biased, there's no doubt about it. It takes special people that report side effects, but it's a second best option that we have for assessing side effects. And there's a number of other ways that we can assess side effects of medications, but these adverse event reporting databases are really, really important in our world. And so the authors performed a technique called disproportionality analysis looking at reports of hair loss from semaglutide, terzepatide, and the other GLP-1 GIP receptor agonists. And disproportionality analysis is a technique. It's a statistical technique where you look at data and you ask, based on this database, how often would we expect hair loss to occur from this drug? And then how often does it actually occur? And based on that data, can we say that, wow, there's an unexpectedly high number of cases of alopecia. This is suggesting something important. This is providing us with a signal that this drug may be implicated in hair loss. And so this disproportionality analysis is done often looking at side effects. You look in a database and you ask, let's do some disproportionality analysis on cancer. Wow, this drug that we're looking at here causes cancer way more than we would have expected. What about rashes? What about changes in blood counts? These are really important statistical tests. And so here we're looking at disproportionality analysis related to hair loss. And what this disproportionality analysis leads to is an ROR, a reporting odds ratio, giving us some indication of the propensity of a medication to cause hair loss. And so after doing this fancy statistical test, this disproportionality analysis, if you have an ROR that is well above one, and the confidence interval doesn't cross one, it suggests that, you know what, this drug may cause hair loss. And so the authors of this study, Godfrey and colleagues, did disproportionality analysis looking at all of these GLP-1 slash GIP agonists. So in this database, 84% of 
the entries came from consumers, patients, and 16% were from healthcare practitioners. So that's important. These reports of side effects from these drugs come largely from patients. I think this is really important. You can see that patients play such an important role in some side effects. And in this case with alopecia, patients are driving the reports of side effects from these drugs. There's 199 reports of hair loss from semaglutide, ozempic, and 179 for terzepatide, manjaro, and others. They go by other names as well. So semaglutide and terzepatide lead the reports of alopecia, followed by liraglutide, dulaglutide, and exenatide. And lixacenatide had no reports at all. Now what's important when you think about reports of side effects like alopecia in a database, if a drug just came to market last week, you can imagine you're probably not going to find any data. But if a drug came to market eight years ago, you can imagine, wow, we'll probably find more data. And so we have to be careful about these databases. Just because we find 199 reports doesn't necessarily mean that that drug has a greater propensity. We have to think carefully about uh, you know, a number of factors. But when the authors performed disproportionality analysis, they found that semaglutide and terzepatide had a statistically significant ROR. So there is an increased likelihood that these drugs truly cause hair loss. The ROR was not statistically significant for liraglutide, dulaglutide, and exenatide. And so I think this study is really important. It says to us as a worldwide community that hmm, these weight loss drugs may cause hair loss and we need more studies of this particular side effect. I see a lot of patients with concerns about hair loss from these medications. There's two types of scenarios. One is a patient that develops hair loss after a few weeks. And the other is a patient that reports, you know what, I took this drug and within a week or two, I feel I have hair loss. So I think we need more studies not only to say yes or no, do they cause hair loss, but, you know, what is the timing and what is the mechanism? We believe it's a telogen effluvium. Is it a telogen effluvium in all patients? We clearly need more studies. How commonly does this occur? Is this one in 100, one in 200, one in 800? Who are the patients most likely to have this? Patients with insulin resistance, patients with significant insulin resistance, patients with minor degrees of, of insulin resistance, patients with dramatic weight loss, patients with minimal weight loss, patients with rapid weight loss, 20 pounds in a month. So we need more studies, and this is really an important study that will likely fuel further studies. And I really congratulate these authors for such a wonderful study. In the original reports, the randomized controlled trials of semaglutide and terzepatide, there wasn't reports of hair loss. Now, that really doesn't come as much of a shock. You have to remember that these randomized controlled trials that get drugs approved do not provide us with a framework of the entirety of side effects that a drug can cause. That's what post-marketing research is all about. That's what the collection of post-marketing data is all about, the so-called phase four part of a clinical study. And so when a drug comes to market and I see that it causes this side effect and that side effect, my feeling is, well, that's my list for now. And I fully expect over the next 10 or 15 years, my list of side effects is going to change. And that certainly goes for hair loss. That certainly goes for cancer. That certainly goes for heart disease. That certainly goes for a whole host of side effects. If it takes 25 years for a drug to cause cancer, then you can imagine that a 6 to 12 to 24 week clinical trial is not going to pick up on that particular side effect. And so the authors here remind us that this is really relevant for us to study hair loss from these weight loss drugs. Prescriptions rose from 400,000 in 2015 to 1.6 million in 2020 for these 
classes of medications in the United States. This study is very nice. Of course, all of these database-related studies, when you dig into FDA reporting databases, they have bias. You have to be careful. But it is challenging to assess side effects from medications in the post-marketing world. And this style of study is one of a recognized way of looking at side effects. And so congratulations to these authors. Next week, we're back talking about another medication that affects blood sugars, and that's metformin. We're going to be talking about the use of metformin in central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia, a very nice study published in JAMA Dermatology looking at the genes that are affected by metformin use in patients with CCCA. I look forward to sharing that study with you. Thank you so much for joining me for today's podcast. It's my belief that education and educational endeavors like this podcast can help clinicians acquire new knowledge, which can ultimately help patients. And education can also help hair loss researchers to ask better research questions. And better research questions can give clear answers about how to best diagnose or how to best treat hair loss. And ultimately, this will see benefit in our patients with hair loss. And education can also empower patients to acquire new knowledge so they can engage in critical discussions with their hair loss practitioners, which hopefully will lead to improved care. At the Academy, we're really proud to be able to offer educational programs for clinicians, as well as educational programs for the public. And if you're a practitioner interested in studying hair loss at an advanced level, you might consider applying to the Evidence-Based Hair Fellowship, or EBHF. This is an intense program, but it's a program that equips you with the necessary skills to really help patients. Our next iteration starts January 2026, and we'd love to have you in the program. You can learn more about the EBHF by contacting our administrators at info at donovanhairacademy.com. That's it for this week. I look forward to seeing you next week for another episode of the Evidence-Based Hair Podcast. Thanks so much.